Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, sir. We might have some technical problems, perhaps. No issue, sir. We will we will traverse through it, because sir. Because my I go I'm I don't have a separate internet. It's okay, sir. We will manage. We will traverse through yeah. it, sir. Mine is a hot spot kind of a thing. When we talk about the longest ruling dynasty in India, full of names compete for this distinction. A few contenders like the Cholas and the Mughals immediately come to mind. But have you heard of the Ahum dynasty, which ruled over the northeastern part of India for almost 600 years without a break? It was a kingdom that had resisted the power of the mighty Mughal 17 times. They even had their own way of recording the Ahums, but also the neighbors. What is most intriguing is how they managed to reign for an astounding six centuries, beginning from the 13th century to the 18, to 1826, when the Treaty of Yandabo was concluded. To help us get acquainted with the lesser known history of the Ahums, today we have with us renowned author and journalist, Mr. Arup Kumar Dotta, who hails from Assam, and has written 18 books, which include The Ahums, published in 2016, The Brahmaputra, Unicornis, The Anagarika's Swan Song. He has to his name a multitude of accolades, including a Lifetime Achievement Award, uh, honor by the Association of Writers and Illustrators for Children New Delhi, the Shankar's Award in 1979, and most recently, he has been awarded the Civilian Award of Padma Shri by the Government of India in 2018. So a very warm welcome, sir, to our platform. Thank you. And a very warm and a very happy Bihu, sir. Okay, to you also. Thank you, sir. So starting with the most elementary question, sir, who were the Ahums and where did they come from? Please help us get acquainted with the rich dynasty, rich history of this dynasty. Now, good evening, everyone. We are joined this meet. My mandate, as Dorian has told you, at this live session, live knowledge session, is to offer you all a broad glimpse into one of the most fascinating dynasties of medieval India, the Ahoms. Hundred years from the beginning of the 13th to the beginning of the 19th century. I had delved deep into this dynasty while writing my book, The Ahoms, A Reimagined History, published by Harper Collins India, which was released just last month and was absolutely enthralled with the saga of the Ahoms. This saga is replete with tales of war, bravery, brutality, love, loyalty, treachery, and treason. Of course, it will be impossible to convey all of that within the drab ambit of this brief lecture. But I hope it will be enough to prick your curiosity about a slice of the history of a region which has lain at the periphery of the consciousness of the historians of mainland India. Now in 1228 CE, an event of great significance occurred in the Brahmaputra Valley. A group of Shan or Thai warriors led by a brave and far-sighted leader named Sukafa left his original home in the Shan country which encompassed Myanmar and Yunnan province of China, swept through the Patkai range of mountains into the upper part of the Brahmaputra Valley and set up the nucleus of a powerful empire. Sukafa's small group consisted of choice warriors of the Shan tribe 
whose fighting skills were unmatched. Their reputation of being osama or peerless had preceded them. And this is what the indigenous communities then living in the valley called them when they arrived. You see the Shans themselves, they could not pronounce the word S. They pronounced it instead as H, which meant that Osama became Ahoma when they said it. The Sukafas people came to be known as the Ahoms amongst the local people. It is also surmised that the term for the entire region, which till then had been called Pradyotishpur or Kamruk, came to be called Assam in a similar derivation from the Ahoms. Gradually, the Ahom rulers expanded their tiny principality till they held sway over the entire Brahmaputra Valley and the surrounding hills. During their time of their greatest power and dominance, they, don't, they all, almost all the tribes in this region owed allegiance to them. Now, by the time of their arrival, Hinduism had percolated from the Indian subcontinent and was the principal prevalent religion in the Brahmaputra Valley. Also by then, a common language, which today we term as Asmis, was evolving amongst the disparate tribes in the valley. The Ahoms are non-Hindus. They had a religion of their own with defined rituals practiced by their priests, as well as a language belonging to the Sino-Tibetan Thai group. They were highly cultured people who had books on history, astrology, scriptures, political treatises, religious ethics, mythology, etc., written in the Thai language. Yet, their enlightened kings wisely gave up their own language and religion to adopt those of their subjects aware that this would create the empathy between the rulers and the ruled, so essential for the well-being and continuation of their dynasty. From the time Sukafa entered Assam in 1228 till this region was annexed by the British in 1826, for nearly six centuries, his descendants reigned over a greater part of the Brahmaputra Valley. Few dynasties in the world, let alone Asia, had enjoyed such a long period of almost unbroken rule. During the course of the centuries, no less than 39 monarchs had ascended the Ahom throne during the 600 years. First at the original capital, Sarailu, later at important ones like Gorgon, and finally at Jorhat. Naturally enough, some of these kings had long tenures and some extremely brief. The reigns of some witnessed political, economic, and cultural progress, while those of others were nondescript and unremarkable interims. Among the great rulers who follow Sukafa, we have Suhumum. He ruled from 1497 till 1539. By his time, Brahminical Hinduism had penetrated into the royal household, and Hindu priests competed with the traditional Deodhai Shan priests to influence Ahom royalty. One outcome was that the Ahom kings, apart from the Shan or Thai names, also took on Hindu names. Suhungmung, for instance, took on the additional name of Sorganarayan given to him by his priest, a Hindu 
priest advisors. Tilly ascended the throne. The Ahom's kings who had succeeded the progenitor Sukhafa, I'm, I'm talking about Suhung Mung, had been content to remain within a small kingdom set up by Sukhafa. Suhung Mung's reign was, is notable for the fact that it was the first time that the Ahoms left the confines of the kingdom and began a series of campaigns to subjugate <coughs> major neighboring tribes such as the Chutias and the Kosaris, a process which, with the passage of time, culminated in the Ahom kingdom extending across the entire Brahmaputra Valley from Sadia in the east to Goalpa in the west. Another ruler, another remarkable ruler was Susengfa, also known as Buddhan Swarganarayan or Pratap Singha, who ruled from 1603 to 1641. His reign was marked by great social reforms, as also the Asmis language being made the official language of the court, along with the Thai language. Also, Susengfa was the first um, um, monarch to have direct confrontation with Mughal invaders. I think all of you know that the Mughals, especially during the time of Aurangzeb, had made a number of attempts to conquer Assam, with one of their generals, whose name was Mir Jumla, even succeeding in occupying for a while the Ahom capital at Gorgaon before eventually retreating. Now, till the time of Susengfa, the powerful coast kingdom, which lay to the west between Ahom territory and the Mughal occupied Bengal had acted as a buffer. But when the Kosh kingdom disintegrated, the Ahoms had to directly confront invading Mughal armies. This resulted in a series of stirring wars, the most notable of which was the Battle of Horaighat, which for once and all destroyed Mughals' aspirations of conquering Assam. These battles also produced a number of warrior heroes, such as Lasit Borfukon, Atan Buragohai, and Bagh Hazarika, who today form a part of the Asmis folklore. The Ahom dynasty too is remarkable for producing a number of heroic women who through their bravery aged themselves indelibly on the collective psyche of the Asmis people. One of these was Mula Gavaru, who donned on a battle dress to avenge the killing of her husband on the battlefield and fought till her death. Another was Joy Moti Kuri, who endured abominable torture to force her to reveal the hiding place of her husband, Prince Godadhar, or Queen Fulesari, who had been one of the few women to have been invested with the proxy responsibility of donning on a monarchical mantle because an astrologer had warned her husband against ascending the throne. That was the era of women becoming kings because an astrologer had warned Shibohingo that he must not ascend the throne but have his wife become the queen. Among the monarchs during whose rule there had been events of great significance were Sutamla or Zoidhwaja Singha, 1648 to 1663, whose ill-fated attempts to wrest back a home territory from invading Mughals saw the temporary loss of his capital, Gorgaon, to them. Su Supung Mung, 
और चक्रधर सिंह 1663-1669 हु सिलेक्टेड लासिद बर्फकन टू बैटल एंड फाइनली डिफीट द मुगल्स सुनियाथा और उदयदत्त सिंह 1669-1673 हुज रेन फाइनली सॉ द एंड ऑफ मुगल इन्वेजन or saw the end of mughal mughal invasion with the battle of horaighat which was fought in 1671 for a decade after horaighat dark days descended upon the ahom kingdom because of palace intrigues and infighting among the nobles till the advent of sutafa or godadhar singh 1681 to 1696 who brought about renewed stability as well as embarked on a move to rebuild the kingdom and push it on its way to prosperity perhaps the greatest monarch among the ahom rulers was sukrungpa or rudra singh 1696 to 1714 whose reign witnessed as mis society attain the zenith of prosperity and glory during his period under the supervision of a master mason named ghanasyam khanikar brought from odisha not only was a new capital called rangpur constructed but also a fantastic array of palaces water reservoirs temples stone bridges sports pavilions etc were constructed he opened up the cloistered kingdom to outside influences encouraged trade with the outside world and tried to bring into asmi society all that was best from mainland india during his reign there was an economic intellectual and cultural efflorescence unmatched by any preceding period such as the ambition of this monarch that in an essay never before undertaken by any ahom king before he contemplated venturing out of the traditional ahom boundary in the west and launching an expedition to capture bengal traveling to guwahati and camping there he with the help of allies from the various tribes who owed allegiance to him mustered a huge army for this purpose it was at that point of time that fate intervened rudra singh was afflicted with smallpox and died at guwahati itself thereby cutting short what might have been a history changing episode various causes ensured that the decades following the reign of rudra singh were ones which saw the gradual decay and decline of the ahom kingdom the biggest cause was that the palace gave up its religious tolerance which earlier had been shown by kings like sukafa and allowed hindu priests to act against the followers of the great puruh hongkadev whose ekahoron namodharma religion had a huge following among the subjects the resultant conflict saw a serial series of rebellions which were ruthlessly put down but continued to simmer weakening ahom authority in the realm the final nails in the ahom coffin were driven by palace intrigues and rivalries with one senior ahom official bodon borfukon going to myanmar and poisoning the mind of the king there against his fellow countrymen sensing an opportunity to capture the ahom kingdom the burmese king sent a huge army to assam in 
which was easily overrun, which easily overran the weakened Ahom defenses. I think it should be 1816, not 1826, sorry. Which overran the weakened Ahom defenses, forcing the then monarch Chandrakanta Singha to flee to Guwahati and plead with the British for help. <coughs> The victorious Burmese, called Mans in the Asmis language, perpetrated abominable atrocities on the helpless Asmis population, marking what is indubitably the bleakest period of Ahom history. To cut a long story short, the British responded positively to the Ahom king's pleas. The Anglo Burmese wars ensued, the Burmese were expelled, and Ahom was annexed by the colonies through the Yandabu Treaty of 1826. It is ironical that the Ahoms who lost an entire kingdom were not signatories to the treaty which caused that loss. There are numerous facets to the legacy left behind by the Ahom rulers. But I will digress on just two of these. Firstly, through initiating a cycle of conflict and synthesis and bringing the Brahmaputra Valley under a single administration and providing a generally enlightened and stable rule, the Ahoms initialized a process of homogenization. It was therefore primarily due to the Ahom dynasty that the pre-colonial Asmis nation was, nation was born. To fully grasp this aspect, we have to understand the complex ethnological profile of the Brahmaputra Valley prior to the entry of Sukhafa. Through millennia, there had been periodic inflow to this region of migrants from outside. The Mongoloids, who had their origin in West China, came in sporadic waves to become the dominant racial element in the northeast of India. The constant but periodic inflow initiated a process of conflict and dispersal till the settlers colonized the valleys and mountains in a mind-boggling number of communities contained within small kingdoms or principalities. <coughs> each possessing distinct language and culture of its own. During the Ahom reign, there was a synthesis of these disparate ethnic entities and the evolution of a distinct Asmis language, culture, and nationalist identity. Greater political and cultural intercourse, intermarriages, and other social exchanges between the tribes ultimately broke racial and cultural barriers and imbued a solidarity and nationalistic spirit to the people. Periodic unrelenting assault from the West, which had to be repulsed, reinforced this Asmis nationalism. The disparate tribes being also bonded together by the religious and cultural renaissance ushered in by Vaishnava saints, such as Mahapuru, Hongkar. So the first aspect of the Ahum legacy is that they were responsible for the building up of the greater Asmis race. Now, moreover, what marks out the Ahom dynasty was the part it played in shaping the religious and cultural profile of Southeast Asia. The renowned Bengali scholar, Padma Vihushan Suniti Kumar Chatterjee, amongst others, advocated this postulate. Let me quote, 
the most noteworthy military achievement of the ahoms was the holding the muslim expansion from north india through bengal there were persistent efforts on the part of the muslim rulers of bengal turkey pathan and indian muslims to conquer assam all through the centuries and we have very detailed accounts of the campaigns of the mughal generals in assam but these fights between ahom ruling houses between the ahom boro and hindu asmis troops on the one hand and the bengalized turki and pathan and north indian muslims as well as rajput and other hindu troops under the moguls on the other show assam in a particularly favorable light and lines asmis kings stopped the muslim flood from penetrating into burma and beyond in a wave of aggressive warfare and conquest colonization proselytization and then con- conquest of arab merchants and the religious teachers in indonesia led to the final islamization of indonesia the arabs and later on indian muslim merchants from western india found a direct line of access by sea to malaysia and indonesia but a land route for aggressive advance was denied to the indian muslims by the ahoms of assam otherwise the history of burma and indochina might have been different quotation closed this quotation was taken from sunil kumar chatterjee's the place of assam in the history and civilization of india published in 1970 now we need to recognize that the brahmaputra valley was strategically located with the river itself cutting it did across the entire valley from east to west becoming a highway for religious and cultural transference between the two ancient civilizations of india and china as also between india and southeast asia thus the brahmaputra valley formed a natural corridor across which expansionist brahmanical hinduism could travel to burma and southeast asian regions as early as the 1st century ad it can be surmised that the hindu king samuda who ruled burma in 105 ad had proceeded there through assam as also the hindus who led the shans in the conquest of the mouth of the mekong in 280 ad the valley therefore played a seminal role in carrying hinduism and later buddhism to regions of southeast asia it was also a route through which indian ideas and literature including the two epics ramayan mahabharat travel to these nations in the process south asia during ancient times was widely hinduized aggressive propagation by hindu proselytes led to the erection of numerous hindu kingdoms for example the champa civilization of vietnam funan in cambodia the khmer, khmer empire in indochina <coughs> langa an old keda in the malayan peninsula sri vijayan singhasari and mazapahit kingdoms of indonesia etc no doubt brahmanical hinduism was gradually supplanted by buddhism between the 1st and the 5th century and later by islam in some regions of southeast asia in the 15th and christianity in the early 16th but vestiges of hindu civilization remain in the form of magnificent relics or ingrained in customs and mores 
Now the Ahoms, while facilitating Hindu expansionism in Southeast Asia, actually prevented Islamic influence from <coughs> penetrating into Burma and further to other nations across the land route. The land route blocked, proponents of the religion had to take the sea route in order to reach Southeast Asia, which explains why the Indonesian archipelago was the first region where Islam could get a toehold before spreading in the region. What could have loomed as aggressive conversion to Islam by the land route was terminated at the Brahmaputra Valley itself. There can be no doubt that the Ahoms are responsible for stemming Islam from flowing into Burma and beyond through conflict, conquest, colonization, and conversion. Had they not done so, the religious culture scenario in Southeast, scenario in Southeast Asia might have been entirely different from what it is today. This is indubitably the most significant contribution of the Ahoms <coughs> as far as Asia is concerned and the abiding factor, fa factor of the legacy they left behind. So basically what I have tried to say is that the Ahoms are responsible firstly in creating the greater as miseries and secondly in uh, enabling the current profile, the uh, religious and social profile of Southeast Asia as it prevails today. And uh, this broadly was what I had to want to say as the introduction to the Ahom dynasty. And Doreen, if somebody would like to ask questions now, I'll be very happy to answer these. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for enlightening us on the rich history of this uh, very long ruling dynasty. So, uh, as you pointed out, that there were 39 monarchs and uh, such a long and uh, intertwined history of the Ahoms. So, then why do we not uh, find mention of uh, this dynasty in our history books? Even if they are, even if it is mentioned, it is very uh, minuscule. Yes, uh, you know, the Ahoms, they were supposed to have, I mean, as you think, they were supposed to have, you know, been responsible for having the kind of socio cultural and religious profile of uh, which is prevalent in Southeast Asia. Now, this was a major kind of a contribution. It's one of the most important aspects of their legacy. But as Assam is situated in the peripheral zone, what we call it, mainland historians, they are more bothered about what is happening in North India. I mean, their perceptions do not embrace even uh, places in the south, south of India. For example, the rich Tamil culture, the rich Tamil history, finds very little mention you will find in the near uh, Indian historians. And the Northeast and Assam being so far away that, I mean, it doesn't, as I said right in the into the consciousness of mainland historians. And that is why the Ahoms have not been given the due place they actually deserve. Right, sir. But we uh, also saw that how they actually had very uh, frequent uh, exchanges and interactions with other states uh, of the subcontinent, like we, as you mentioned, the Mughals. And we also know that uh, there was, uh, the, we also know that there was Harshavardhan who had actually, uh, you know, uh, 
had honored Bhaskar Varman uh, at a conference held at Kannauj. There were so many interactions taking place uh, with the Mughals, with other uh, kingdoms. But even then, even while uh, while we're talking about Mughal history, very little, very small mention is given to the fight, the struggle between the Ahoms and the Mughals. It is almost overshadowed. Yes, I mean, you compare, compare say, a, our iconic heroes like Lassit Borfukon and Atan Burgohai and see the kind of prominence they are given or lack of prominence they are given in Indian history. Whereas, you know, Chhatrapati Shivaji, who fought the Mughals in the uh, west, southwest. Now he is given that kind of an iconic stature, which he deserves. So it's a matter of, you know, what you call locational disadvantage, I think. And not only about our medieval Assam history, but even, say, our independence our contribution of the Northeast to the independence movement, you do not find, you hardly find any mention anywhere else about that kind of a contribution. So I think it is time our mainland, what you call uh, mainland historians, they wake up to the fact that we, the, uh, the Northeast has contributed towards uh, significantly tour in the history of this country. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, I also wanted to ask that, as you mentioned, that Ahoms uh, created, why, through assimilation, created the larger uh, Assamese identity, the Assamese race. So before that, before coming of Sukafa on the scene, were there any other kingdoms of the size and stature similar to that of the Ahoms before uh, the Ahoms came? Can you help us understand the demography of Assam uh, before the coming of the Ahoms? <coughs> As I said in my lecture, you see, there were sporadic migrations to the Northeast, mainly of the uh, Mongoloid uh, race from Western China, primarily from Yunnan province. But this kind of entry, this kind of advent, this kind of migration, was not at one time, it was sporadic. It was, it came wave after wave. So when these Mongoloid migrants settled and became the dominant ethnic element in the Northeast, in the valleys and the hills of the Northeast, they uh, formed very small, small communities. You know, each, each was a very, what they call self-sufficient kind of a community with his own dialect, with his own culture. Melting pot of a huge number of ethnic identities, ethnic communities. For example, the great Boru race, they settled, they were the first to migrate to the Bhavata Valley and they were, they settled in the western part of the Brahmaputra Valley. But some of them also went to the, and settled in the hills. And we had the Kacharis who also borrowed this thing. We also had Chutias, you know, diff, lots of different tribes living in the plains and in the hills, the Karbis, the Dimasas. So the Ahoms, when they first came, what they did was they acted as a co aggregating force in bringing all these disparate elements together into one, what you call, uh, greater Asmis nation. So that was, as I emphasized, that was one of the main, what you call, legacies of the Ahoms in forming the greater Asmis race. 
Now, this was done through conquest as well as through other, you know, intermarriage social barriers between different tribes. Ultimately, the tribes are amalgamated into some kind of a cohesive unit. Yes, sir. So what do we know about the uh, socio-cultural and political uh, setup of the Ahoms? And sir, after this question, we would like to uh, take on questions from the participants. Uh, so can you please tell us what is the economic and social uh, setup that they had? The Ahoms? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Ahoms. Uh, well, of this Brahmatra Valley. So status-wise, you had the highest status right from the king to all his ministers. <coughs> Was that they were extremely tolerant and secular. And they listened to their subjects. And the very moment they did stop listening to the subjects, they laid the seeds of their destruction. Now, during the Ahom rule, the North, especially the Brahmaputra Valley, was extremely self-sufficient economically. The villages were self-sufficient. Although foreigners were not allowed to come and trade that much, Oh, they, what you call the Assam itself, except for salt, all other commodities was absolutely self-sufficient, which unfortunately is not the case today. Yes, sir. So uh, we will take on questions from the participants there. I see uh, participants uh, what we're wanting to ask questions from you. So we will take uh, Charbik Kashyap. Uh, can you please unmute your mic and you can ask your question to sir? So first of all, I would like to wish you a very happy Bihu. Okay, thank you. Sir, actually I was fascinated after reading the chapter on the Brahmin prince. How did you maintain such a balance while introducing fiction and imagination and even maintain the factual correctness of the history? Uh, well... You know, the Brahmin prince, that is the story of Sulangfa. Yes, sir. The monarch called Sulangfa. Now, if you look at the Buranjis, Ahom Buranjis, you will find the Sulangfa is the story of Sulangfa is described in a very, just a couple of paragraphs. Because Ahom histories, Ahom Buranjis or histories, they were not what you call extensive descriptions. They are very concise and the information given was given in a very brief kind of way, concise kind of a manner. So what I did was I took the germ of the story narrative and expanded it by introducing new characters, by introducing a new uh, background, even creating a village called Kolabari, which is a fictitious village, and ultimately, you know, taking up just a couple of paragraphs and expanding it into an entire chapter. Now, of course, you will have to have that kind of imagination in order to do so. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, I'm so sorry, my internet has just got disconnected. Uh, <laughs> sorry, sir. Uh, so uh, I hope uh, Sharvik's question was answered. Uh, I will uh, request Amrit uh, Jyoti to uh, unmute your mic and please ask a question to sir.
is Amrit Jyoti here? Uh, okay, Surajit, you can go on, go ahead and ask a question. Surajit Sharma, are you there? Oh, yes. Uh, sir, uh, good evening and a uh, very happy Bhagari Bihu to you. Okay. Uh, am, am I uh, being heard? Yes, sir, you are. Oh, okay. Uh, first thing, sir, um, a purpose to what you just said about North East, uh, about Northern uh, historians from Northern India uh, needing to focus more on the Northeast. I think uh, it's, it's, don't you think, feel that uh, people from the Northeast need to write more about their own region? Uh, historians have a responsibility in this regard. I think you have played a very significant role uh, through your book. And this has been um, uh, missing for a long time. Actually, We need to speak about ourselves in order to be heard, in order to be recognized. And uh, sadly, for a longest period of time, we haven't had quality publications that have been, um, uh, that, that were worthy of being noted by people outside. Uh, so uh, that, that has been a, a bit of a problem, I, th I feel. Uh, I don't know, sir, how do, how do you feel? And the second thing, uh, among the legacies, that you mentioned uh, about the homes, and I think you have focused on this in the book, uh, is that uh, unlike other um, uh, empire builders elsewhere, the Romans, the Turks, uh, the uh, British, the French, uh, see, the homes were different because they did not choose to impose their own language and culture on the subject peoples. And that, that is a very, very important thing. That yes, I think you have, you, have, you have raised that vital point, which I said. You know, those people who create empires, they tend to have this awful propensity of imposing their own culture onto the people they, they have colonized. The Ahoms under Sukhafa were absolutely different from conventional imperialist forces. And as you just pointed out, they you know, gave up their own religion and culture and embraced that of the people they had colonized, they had what you call uh, conquered. So that was a very important contribution, contributor, not only to the uh, gradual power that the Ahoms attained, but also to the longevity of their reign. Now, see, you talked about the British. They created their own empire, but how long did it last? It lasted only around 200 years. While the Ahoms, although admittedly it was a smaller empire, but they had an unbroken rule for almost uh, 600 years. So as Surajit has also rightly pointed out that we uh, as uh, we also need to uh, hold the historians and authors responsible for not probably highlighting the rich history of uh, these regions, not just Assam, I guess. So because you are one of the uh, a few people that uh, write about the Assam history uh, in English. A lot of your work probably has not even been translated to Assamese. I think that also creates a barrier, the uh, the lack of availability or the uh, lack of availability of resources to read. Is that, uh, would you agree on that, sir? Uh, not really, because basically my entire life's mission has been to, you know, somehow familiarize the rest of India with what is going on in the Northeast. And this, the Ahoms, which is this HarperCollins publication, is another attempt to familiarize the rest of India with a slice of history of the Brahmaputra Valley. I mean, I'm not yes, very sir. concerned because, I mean, and uh, you'll find that people outside, especially North India, they are very not that interested in their cultural histories. So 
apart from a few academics, I mean, they are least bothered whether once upon a time there had been a dynasty called the Ahum dynasty. That is sad. And, and perhaps that is also the reason why people who write about North of India, authors, writers who write about this Northeast India, they find it very difficult to get that kind of material published at a national level. <coughs> Uh, let alone a transnational level. So the same problem cuts both ways. Uh, even if we have writers from this region who write in English, they will not find the appropriate publisher to publish their work and distribute it in such a manner that it somehow creates some kind of ripples of interest in this region. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, I would uh, like to go on to a question that uh, Amrit Jati Mohanta ha had uh, posted uh, to on our platform. Uh, I will read out the question because he is not being able to uh, come here on the platform. So, so, so he's asking that every place is a periphery from the rest, uh, for example, Kerala, Kashmir and the east or the western coast. So why is only Assam referred to as the distant or the peripheral or the marginalized? Uh, no, no, every place I don't think so. I beg to disagree with him. You know, it depends upon the kind of political and social situation at that particular point of time. For instance, just before the British annexed Assam, the Northeast was not on the periphery. It was the central point between two major cultures. One was the Indian, mainland Indian culture, and the other was the Chinese cultures. So the Northeast during those days was at the center of things, so to speak. It is only the, the changing circumstances, political as well as other circumstances, which led to, you know, once the British annexed this region, they converted it into an outpost of the British Empire, British Indian Empire. So it lost its earlier centric position and became a remote outpost. And because basically of, because of communication difficulties, and you know, the British also, they realized that Kolkata was not at the center of their empire. So they conveniently shifted ultimately from Calcutta to Delhi. So that if Calcutta had been the capital of British India, uh, remained the capital, perhaps the Northeast would have received greater focus. But by taking it to Delhi, it became even more remote. So I don't think it is right to say, I mean, you have to see the context of the circumstances in which a particular place is located. Right, most definitely. Uh, so there is another question that uh, has been posted and the person is asking that wasn't the Greater Assam Society formed due to the efforts of Srimanta Hongkordev? Yes, I mean, that was another contributing force. But Hongkordev came much later. You see, the process of formation of the Greater Assam Society began from the 13th, 14th century itself. Slowly, one by one, the various ethnic entities, they were taken into the fold of, you know, Ahoms gave what, what is very important for the formation of a society is the kind of political stability. And the Ahoms, by providing a you know, stable political rule, they could bring together disparate elements. 
on the other hand mahapurush shankardev was his role was absolutely vital as far as the religious cultural and other aspects of the assimilation was concerned and you are absolutely right the role of mahapurush shankardev uh from the non political aspect i think was equally vital yes uh so there's another question from uh, rajib goswami i would ask rajib to unmute his mic and ask the question to sir uh rajib can you uh, can you please unmute your mic uh hello do you hear me his question is that what uh yes 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 i we can hear you please go on yeah yeah good afternoon sir happy bhogali priyo to you so okay. what is your comment about this recent question that is coming up in the newspaper a debate is going on about the, the bag hazrika issue we just knew earlier that bag hazrika and ismail siddiqui this character were there this character was there but now this There's a very big debate going on the state that whether that really the Bahadur guy is a fixed character. So would you just so something say us something about a uh, little bit about the because pro, from your experience of body history on the home uh, research on your home history? Uh, well, you know I have spoken about this uh, in a number of forums. <coughs> you know because. of certain elements who are trying to distort history in order to fulfill their own political agendas they are trying to wipe a hero like bag hazrika from the history books of assam i think that is absolutely wrong now i have spoken about this in other platforms mainly that all history is not a documented history there are other sources from which we can surmise that certain incident or certain individual existed now that is what is known as the history that is traditionally passed on from one generation to another which may not be recorded in any kind of history book now if you take this aspect into account i am of the opinion that an individual named bag hazurika did exist he was a very brave lieutenant of lasit borfukan during the campaign to take the ilakhuli fort in guwahati now i will not go into details because i don't think we have the time this thing but we i mean i'll just simply say that we all think that lasit borfukan cut off the head of his uncle because his uncle was recalcitrant in performing his duty with the immortal phrase my uncle is not dearer to me than my motherland that in people in assam we know we have been born up in with that statement from our childhood yet i don't think you will be surprised to know that this incident is not recorded in any documented history the ahom burunjis does not speak about the beheading of lassis uncle does it mean that this incident never took place that is a figment of imagination no i don't think so because what is known as general collective consciousness of the people the history that consciousness retains is as important as documented history 
and I must rem remind you that the Ahum Buranjis were centered on the king. It only depicted events related to the king. And therefore, things which are not related directly to the king were not put in the documented histories. So ultimately, it is my opinion that Bagh Hazarika was not a fictitious character. He was a real character who played a crucial role in the Horaiga battle. Thank you, sir. Uh, so my question is that your book on the Ahoms, you've called it a reimagined history. So what can a reader expect from the book? What is the reimagined aspect of it? No, it is reimagined because, you know, basically I just said that the Ahom Buranjis are very concise. They do not give any incident in a detailed way. So it's very dry reading. I mean, it is pure history. That at such and such time, such and such year, this, this was done. I mean, the academic would like to read it, but it is it doesn't make for, you know, reading by, uh, say, lay readers. So what I have tried to do is use my imagination in order to make the, these events more readable by presenting them as if they were happening, you know, as in, as in a work of, say, fiction. But the basis of those, that kind of uh, description, this imaginative description is accurate history. There is no distortion of historical facts, nor are these uh, the kind of scenarios which I have visualized, nor are they totally fictitious. Because, again, as I have said in other forums, you know, whatever description of the village Kalabar is there, it is taken from actual historical description given elsewhere in other sources. Those may not be Ahom Buranjis, but they are records which can be found elsewhere. So ultimately, although it is an imaginative account, there is nothing fake about the kind of narrative that is playing out in the book, The Homes, A Reimagined History. Uh, thank you for clarifying that, sir. And also, that this is there is one aspect that has been highlighted the most, which is how the uh, Ahoms, Nasid Borfukan, the commander, actually uh, defeated the Mughals or uh, you know staved off the Mughals seventeen times. How was that uh, possible? Can you please throw some light on that? No, what was the true. military aspect of it? Nasid Borfukan did not stave off the invaders 17 times no you know all in all invade there were 17 invasions from outside even before the homes came there were invasions right. so only from pratap singh singha onwards you know the homes had to directly confront uh, in, uh, the Mughals or the Islamic invaders. So in uh, you know what happened was that previously as I said there was a buff there were buffers between the Bengal was occupied by the Mughals. But the coast kingdom, the powerful coast kingdom of Naranarayan, King Naranarayan and Silarai, the Kai king, it, it you know, bore the brunt of this Islamic assault. The Ahoms did not have to directly bear the brunt. So some of the invasions of this region were taken by, uh, staying, taken by the Kusish. Prior to that, 
there were other invaders who had come and they were repulsed by that existed. So entire, there were 17 attacks, but I think the Ahoms were attacked only half a dozen times. I have I have, haven't counted the exact number, but they were the assault came and not only Lassit Borfokan, but others were also involved in fighting the uh, Mughals. Now, as you know, the Mirzumla, as I had said, he came and occupied, he defeated the Ahoms and he occupied the thing. Uh, occupied uh, the capital, Ahom capital, uh, Gorgon. Now, and the king then, the royal of the king, he had to leaving behind his capital. Now, during that time, Lafitte was a very young, I mean, boy. Not boy exactly, he was a youth. So he was not instrumental in ultimately, it was Atan Buragohai who was instrumental in the fact that the uh, Mughals had to leave Gorgon and go back to Bengal. So Lassit Borfokan was involved in only one campaign, which ultimately culminated firstly in the taking back of Guwahati from the Mughals and secondly, the Saraighat War, which finally defeated the Mughals altogether. So when we're talking about Mir Jumla, we uh, also know that the only daughter of uh, Joydhar Singha, uh, who was also the niece of Lasit Borfukon, was given away as ransom. Uh, so are there any more uh, instances of such exchanges taking place between the Mughals or other states uh, in case of uh, probably say marriage or in these kind of instances again i couldn't get this thing uh, sir ramani sir ramani gaburu yeah as she was given away as ransom to mirjumla are there any more instances uh, of exchanges that took place between the ahoms and the other uh, uh, such kingdoms yes uh, there were instances like cannot give you the exact thing, but some uh, Ahom ladies uh, related to the king were sent to uh, Myanmar, to the king of Burma, the Burmese king. And, you know, some of their descendants, even today, are supposed to be living in uh, current Myanmar. Yes, sir. So, uh, sir, as you also had mentioned that how the Burmese were also responsible in the decline or the downfall of the Ahoms and uh, how, uh, how that was taking place. Sir, so what, what is the Muammaria rebellion? Can you please help us understand uh, how that uh, phased out? Uh, Lorraine, just give me a minute. I'll get the charge. Yes, sir. Because the mobile, I think the laptop is running out of battery. Just give me one yes, minute, sir. I'll fix this problem. No issue, sir. So far, it has been a very interesting session and uh, sir had to go get his charger. Uh, we can uh, see that how rich a dynasty, how rich a history we have had of for in the northeast uh, especially the region of the brahmaputra valley how uh, the ahoms had come from uh, what is present day myanmar and the yunnan province of china and how they assimilated with the local uh, population how they built up what is known as the ahom uh, sorry uh, the assam uh, identity it's very interesting, but uh, it is also unfortunate that so far uh, it, the dynasty and uh, so much of Assam history or Northeast history has not been given the uh, re the recognition that uh, it actually should have had. 
and uh, tiny steps are being taken as uh, for example how new delhi celebrated the 400th anniversary of lasit borfukan on lasit divak i think such tiny steps are being taken and uh, we really hope that uh, we will be able to give more recognition as it requires i hope uh, sir is back with the charger yeah yeah <laughs> now everything is okay yes sir Now so so we were about this uh this uh event in delhi yes sir but i, I was wondering why only lasit borfukan exactly i, I was mean, also if, going to ask that if, same question sir uh if you going you are going to project you don't project one individual because a home history is filled with people of lasis caliber i had mentioned one suhung mong he yes. was the person yes. behind the expansion of ahom kingdom we rudra singh i think was the biggest this thing was the what you call the uh, most powerful and you know most important ahom monarch almost at par with uh, sukafa now these people these you know the entire dynasty and not only ahom dynasty they are the boros they had their own history. the sutias they had their history the kosaris you know there should be an attempt to project a holistic uh, thing of assam's history not only one individual being projected outside yes most definitely that is very important because uh, as sir has pointed out that even apart from the ahom uh, history which started from the medieval period, times uh, in indian history we uh, there were so many principalities and kingdoms that were there even before the ahoms came uh, we hope that one day we will be reading about all of these in our history books and uh, as we come to the uh, towards the end of this session sir thank you so much for enlightening us with uh, so much information that we did not had the opportunity to read in our history books uh, thank you so much sir okay thank you for having me thank you it was a I pleasure thank, sir uh, i thank the organizers or the force behind this zoom meet uh it's called i think argumentative indians.com is it right yes so argumentative and, indians and mayank tell him that i offer my thanks okay yes so most definitely thank you so much sir so this was a session with author and journalist arup kumar dotto and we got to know a lot about the ahom history and also how lack of uh, our access to these uh, rich histories has uh, actually kept us from knowing our history uh, is is something that we should be worried about and we should also uh, look forward to more uh, such sessions and you can check more of these uh, knowledge sessions and debate sessions that take place uh, on our platform